uh, for me, the right to life is such an important issue. It's not one of those issues where you can just, you know, uh, bury and sweep under the carpet and, and, and ignore. It's part of the very, you know, essence of who we are is where our stance is on the issue uh, of the rights to life. You know, that sentence, supporting the right to life of everybody, is now a minority um, uh, politics in Ireland at the moment, as far as the political makeup of the parties are concerned. And we are that party that holds that flag uh, right now uh, in Ireland. America has played a phenomenally important role in the development of this country, both pre-independence and since the independence of the South of Ireland. The struggle for Irish freedom would not have happened without our brothers and sisters uh, in the United States. Irish America was pivotal also for the Good Friday uh, Agreement. The Good Friday Agreement would not have happened uh, without uh, Irish America. And I will say that the Irish, uh, the ancient order of Hibernians, you know, deserve absolutely significant and special mention in the role that has been played in all of those elements. Absolutely. The, the different presenters on this call have been right when they've said that Ireland has gone from one of the safest places in the world to be a baby in the womb to one of the most dangerous. And that's something that we need to band together to stop. We at Americans United for Life have been so proud over the decades to work with Irish leaders and, and just the strong Irish citizens in fighting abortion and in standing for life. And we will do everything that we can to continue working with all of you. So absolutely contact the office, would love to meet with you, would love to come over to Ireland again and, and continue to work with you all there. Um, our doors are open. <music>
believe we're the largest Irish organization outside of Ireland. These prayer vigils, these sidewalk counseling efforts have to be increased in both the United States and in Ireland. There has to be less timidity and more daring in the use of face-to-face -face direct action, prayer vigils and um, outreach, and then more service to the poor and mothers who have young children. This year during a, a COVID crisis, we were, New York City uh, was the epicenter of uh, the American COVID crisis in the spring. And I endeavored and have carried out an effort to give away um, $1 million worth of essential goods to uh, poor young families. We have close to an 18% unemployment rate even now in the Bronx. Still 35%, 40% of Catholics still go to Mass in Ireland. It is a sleeping giant. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we need to do is wake that giant up. There is a parallel between the Catholic Church in Ireland and what we saw in the United States. But the situation in the United States, I think, is, is far worse, all right, because it's far greater and I think in Ireland, we have a chance with that 35, 40% of mass goers in Ireland to really impact the bishops where the faithful here in the United States have no impact, no influence on the bishops at all. Fine. <laughs> Father in heaven, in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, we ask to send the Holy Spirit down upon us, Lord. Please bless this broadcast. Uh, allow your truth to be on our lips, on our tongue. Open up the hearts and minds of those who are listening and watching. Uh, Lord, you know what our desire is. Our desire is that in some small way tonight and going forward, filled with the Holy Spirit, that we can bring this scourge of abortion to an end in our cities, our state, our countries, and our culture. And so, Lord, please bless that. And we ask this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for all the martyrs and saints, St. Patrick and the Blessed Virgin Mary, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, thank you, John, for uh, including me in this uh, wonderful opportunity to speak to the diaspora, uh, the Irish diaspora. Uh, and yes, I've been to Ireland twice. Uh, the first time was actually purely recreational. Although I was uh, asked to do some activism the last day I was there, and it got quite a bit of uh, publicity. And the second time that I went uh, was uh, for the purpose of activism. And the second time I went was really at the prompting of another priest 
who heard about me through my Red Rose rescue team while I was there. But anyway, we had about two weeks, 17 days of activism, traveled around the country, did in, uh, doing a meeting with pro-life activism, not an activist, not only in the Republic, but also up in Northern Ireland, uh, doing prayers of exorcism in front of abortion mills. And one of the things that I spoke to the people about was the fact that I am committed to pro-life activism in Ireland. I am hoping that very soon I will get the Irish in citizenship that I rightfully deserve because my grandparents were Irish. I have submitted all the paperwork. And that I really think traveling around Ireland and getting a sense of what's going on there, uh, that we need some real activism and we need the church to be energized and organized. Uh, one of the problems they have in Ireland, I can see that we have the same problem over here, is really a passivity within the church, a lack of leadership within the church. And I'm talking about the Catholic Church. And so that would be one of my emphasis in terms of uh, spending time over in Ireland. And I'm hoping this COVID-19 thing uh, uh, passes as quickly as possible so I can get back over there. And then the other thing that I really think uh, is important is that we not repeat the mistakes that we've made in the United States in regards to the pro-life movement. There is a paradigm here in the United States that has allowed pre-born child killing, government sanctioned, government protected, government funded, daily mass murder of pre-born children to go on for 50 years. And uh, it really centers around overly cautious incrementalism. And I really told the people that uh, we need to start focusing in on decisive strategies than pre-born child killing. And I'm not going to get into them right now. Uh, there are decisive strategies depending on any point in time, uh, any point in history. Uh, for instance, a decisive strategy than pre-born child killing while President Trump is president would differ from a decisive strategy than pre-born child killing if there was a baby killing president in the White House. So it's a matter of looking at the landscape. It's a matter of looking at your assets, uh, those uh, resources that you have. But our mind always has to be about decisively ending pre-born child killing. Uh, and that is always my emphasis as a 25-year pro-life activist uh, that is focused on always peaceful and prayerfully doing my activism but not being afraid to use the word protest. That's why they call me the protest priest. Peaceful, prayerful protest. The types of things that we saw Martin Luther King use to bring about civil rights for uh, his people here in the United States. The type of activism protest that we saw Lech Walesa and Solidarity use in Poland. Uh, again, there are decisive strategies then pre-born child killing. Uh, just to end with this, uh, my Irish roots go back to uh, the late 1700s, I've had a priest in the economy side of my family uh, for that length of time. They've suffered persecutions. And I'm very sensitive to the fact that uh, it was the Irish that came and evangelized the United States uh, as mission territory. And I think uh, that our Lord is calling me uh, to come to Ireland and do the exact same thing in Ireland specifically uh, with this issue. In that regard, in 2013, and at the time I didn't realize the significance of the gift, somebody gave me a, a crucifix, and I don't have it with me right now, that has a first-class relic of St. Patrick, and that's my exorcism crucifix that I've used around the United States and all around Ireland, this exorcism crucifix with a first-class relic of St. Patrick. Uh, so... Uh, that is just a little sense of, of, of where I'm at and uh, what my uh, hopes are for the future. I am committed to going back to Ireland at the first opportunity and continue organizing and energizing the Catholic movement over there, always with the mind that we should work with everyone to decisively end pre-born child killing. Hopefully, Ireland will be a, a major victory for us. Uh, again, it looks like uh, it could go either way here in the United States. If President Trump is given a second term, uh, then there's a great deal of optimism 
if indeed he's not given a second term, then uh, we're going to have to be in defensive mode, which is not where we want to be. Uh, we really want to be in a proactive mode to decisively end the daily mass murder of preborn children. So with that, John, back to you and the rest of the program. Glenn Foster is the president and CEO of Americans United for Life in Washington, D.C., AUL were active with our group, as I said earlier, and Friends of Ireland in the lead up to the campaign to save Ireland's Eighth Amendment. AUL's legal strategists have been involved in every pro-life case before the U.S. Supreme Court since Roe v. Wade. Catherine. Good evening, everyone. It is such a privilege to be able to join all of you here tonight. And while 2020 may not be a typical year and We've all had to get used to gathering over Zoom instead of over a mug of coffee or a pint of Guinness. Uh, <laughs> but as we come together to battle this deadly serious virus that's reshaped the world as we know it, uh, I'm also just so grateful and inspired by the way that we've leaned into these new technologies in ways that really facilitate the type of transoceanic collaboration that we're seeing here tonight. Uh, as you said, I'm Catherine Glenn Foster. I'm president and CEO of Americans United for Life. And I am proud to lead Americans United for Life. We're America's original national pro-life group, a nonpartisan, nonprofit force for life in America and around the world. We were, as you said, founded two years before Roe v. Wade uh, came and struck down our state's good, life-affirming pro-life laws. And for coming up on 50 years now, we have fought for the rights of mothers and their children, born and pre-born, across parliaments and congresses and state houses and courtrooms in capitals and communities throughout the world, passing and defending laws to protect women and babies and educating people on just how abhorrent abortion is and why we need these types of protective laws. And Americans United for Life's 60 model bills ready to be adapted and passed protecting all life from conception to natural death. Now, as for myself, I'm a constitutional attorney, I'm a mother, and I'm also a post-abortive woman. And I am honored to join John and all of the other fantastic panelists as we look at the human right to life in context across the world. Because this fight, the fight for the human right to life, for the sanctity of human life, it is truly the fight of our generation. But while laws are absolutely critical in the fight for life, it's not just about laws, right? It takes all of us contributing in all of our unique ways to establish a culture of life because law and policy victories, they flow downstream from establishing the truth that's inherent all around us of the value and the dignity possessed by each and every person. We are all human, we are all special, we all matter. And at the end of the day, the pernicious ideology of abortion, it's about one thing, it's about dehumanization. Since the dawn of civilization, persecution has been based on the lie that there's a disruption in our common humanity. If one class is so different from us, are they really human at all, people ask. If they're not really human, then they certainly are not obliged to receive human rights. And then once people begin to embrace that ideology, it's impossible to equally apply the basic human rights that are endowed to us by our creator. And that is exactly what has happened to the preborn. They have been dehumanized to a point where they're closer to animals or a science experiment than the real existing human beings that they are for some people. Children in the womb are young, sure, but since when does age confer human rights? Children in the womb are dependent on others, but since when does self-sufficiency confer human rights? These precious, unique, wonderfully created human beings deserve human rights because they are human. Full stop as every human being does. And our failure to recognize those rights doesn't make them disappear. But we have an abortion industry that has bet everything on a strategy of total repeal of common sense abortion laws worldwide, believing against the evidence that abortion would be safe if it were just made legal. But we see here in America that women have lost that bet big time. We lost it when the Supreme Court struck down abortion laws in all 50 states in Roe v. Wade. The documented record of the consequences of that hubris, it's tragic. 1,200 
health and safety violations reported in just the last decade, implicating well over 300 abortion facilities in hazardous, unclean abortions, not to mention the colossal toll that abortion has extracted in human lives and in the physical and emotional suffering of survivors. No one is spared from the horror of abortion, and the data bears that out. My team's deep investigation across all 50 American states, we are just weeks away from publication from, of that in the groundbreaking expose, Unsafe. It exposes the abortion businesses that have been operating without a license. The businesses using untrained, unlicensed, unqualified abortionists and staff that have been repeatedly fined for filthy conditions and dangerously mishandling narcotics and other drugs. As it has since the days before Roe in 1973, the abortion industry operates as if the laws regulating abortion simply don't exist. And it is our job to stop that. And I have attended global pro-abortion conferences undercover where I've sat in the room with, I've sat at round tables with abortion activist lawyers who were strategizing on how to tear down common sense protections for women and children in every single nation in the world one by one. We saw that play out in Ireland two years ago with the 2018 referendum passing the, the 36th Amendment to the Constitution and repealing the Eighth Amendment, which we at AUL were proud to work on both back in 1983 and in 2018, standing alongside strong Irish allies. We continue to see the struggle over the lives of our youngest brothers and sisters in Argentina, in Poland, and in other nations around the world that are under attack from radical pro-abortion activists and pro-choice ideologues. But I believe that we are truly at a watershed moment to change everything for the better. A time when we can truly protect life both in America and across the world. With the elevation of Justice Amy Coney Barrett, we now have a solid pro-life majority on the US Supreme Court. And that means that state yes. legislators across America who are already overwhelmingly pro-life, that they're going to have the chance to pass meaningful community protections for the pre-born and their mother. And that legislation will not be immediately struck down by activist pro-abortion federal courts. Indeed, since 1992, when the Supreme Court affirmed that states have the constitutional authority to regulate abortion in the Planned Parenthood v. Casey case, it began to undo the damage that Roe v. Wade had done by nullifying the abortion regulations of 49 states in 1973. Now, we had a setback in the Supreme Court in 2016, but this year the court indicated that it is ready for states to pass more and more protective, life-affirming bills into law and boy, are they. <laughs> On average, 60 a year over the last decade, close to half of all the pro-life laws that have been passed over the last 50 years. And we're seeing the fruit of those pro-life laws and of sidewalk advocacy and of life-affirming pregnancy centers and of honest conversations with family and friends. Because since 1992, since that Casey case, the abortion rate in America has plummeted by nearly half saving millions of innocent lives. And it is now at the lowest rate it has been since before Roe v. Wade, before abortion was legal in all 50 states. For me, that is just, that's mind blowing. And Americans United for Life, we have been a key player in this historic life-saving mission as the majority of state legislation protecting the infants and mothers from abortion has, um, has been conceived and drafted by our legal experts and passed by state lawmakers working hand in hand with our legal team and tracked in our annual book, Defending Life. And then we, we work with state attorneys general to defend these laws in court against lawsuits by Planned Parenthood and, and the ACLU and the Center for Reproductive Rights who are seeking to tear down legal protections for women and infants in the womb and relegate America to a regime of unregulated but constitutionally protected back alley abortion that is highly dangerous for mothers and deadly for infants. That is what we exposed in Unsafe. That's what we fight against. And it is a fight that we are winning month by month and hour by hour on the front lines and in our nation's courts. Now, 2020 has been a little bit different. Many state legislatures shut down early due to coronavirus and so many good pro-life bills were introduced but never saw the light of day due to another threat to life, the coronavirus pandemic. We continue mm. to fight late-term abortions, taxpayer funding of abortions, and so many more issues. But we still, this year, saw 19 pro-life laws and resolutions enacted and pro-abortion measures defeated in Maryland and New Hampshire. 
We are on the right side of history, fighting for truth and justice, fighting for the rights of the most vulnerable, marginalized members of our communities. And we are winning, slowly but surely. Here in the US, a majority of even self-described pro-choice people oppose late-term abortions when five-month-old or even older babies can survive outside the womb and can feel pain. And when the abortion is ever more dangerous and even deadly for women. And a majority of even self-described pro-choice people support common sense protections for mothers and babies. Make no mistake, we are making progress for life in our laws, in the abortion rate, and in the hearts and minds of our peoples. We are at a moment of reflection and a moment where we can see true victory in the U.S. And I believe that will be the turning point for the rest of the world. We will respect human dignity in our lifetime. Even though we sometimes see these kinds of backslides, and they are, they're devastating backslides, when, when we see good pro-life laws struck down or overturned or, or you know, all, and altered by amendment. And it's, um, it's devastating. It's heartbreaking. But we are making progress globally. And we can do this by uniting in solidarity across the globe. Pro-life advocates from every corner of the world locking arms in pursuit of the one thing that we all intrinsically share, the human image and rights endowed to us by the one who made us. We can do this together. Thank you, and I'll turn it back to John. Well, thank you, Catherine. Um, we'll pick up also on some of your themes later. Chris Slattery is the founder and president of a remarkable humanitarian organization. It's called EMC Frontline Pregnancy Centers. I got to know Chris a few years ago and I consider him a friend. Um, I, I just don't know where he gets the energy. He has the spirit of the Irish to be sure in his welcoming heart for the most vulnerable, the unborn little baby. Chris has deep roots in Ireland and he has been on visits there on pro-life activism. And as I said earlier, for those of you who are, might be just joining now or listening to us on YouTube or by phone, he lives in the most Irish parish in America, Woodlawn. Chris, welcome. Thank you very much, John. You know, an interesting anecdote, uh, just last night, uh, exactly 40 years ago, I was on my way from the east side of Manhattan to the west side, cutting through Central Park, and I was praying a rosary, and I was on my way back to my west, one, my west 81st Street apartment, and I was right at the base of the Great Lawn. This is the place where John Paul II uh, said masses, and there have been very big concerts, and all of a sudden, um, past 10 p.m., um, I hear these five loud gunshots go off somewhere near or in the park, and the echo of these shots were in the castle I was passing, the Belvedere Castle, where they have the uh, Shakespeare in the park, um, and that's the background. Ten minutes later, I get back to my apartment, and on the news was that John Lennon had just been killed with five gunshots. I offered that rosary instantly for whoever had just been shot. So I had, I may have been the first to offer a rosary for him. And I thought about this man, what a remarkable uh, impact he made and millions um, thronged to uh, memorialize him. And I thought, wow, what one man can make a difference. I didn't agree with all his philosophies of life. His music was beautiful, but it got me to imagine. Um, and I had just that year, 1980, gone to my first March for Life. And I saw thousands, not hundreds of thousands, but individuals who were fighting for life. And I was wondering that year, what difference could I make? Well, within a year after that incident, of the murder of John Lennon. I was out south in Manhattan. I was on Park Avenue South in front of an abortion clinic on my way to work. Uh, and I stopped on the plaza and rescued my first child in sidewalk counseling without really knowing what I was doing. Some young lady had invited me to come over. I was in my three-piece suit on my way to work. 
And that is what started me into life saving, literally probably about 1982. At that time, in New York City alone, just in the five boroughs or counties of New York City, we were aborting 115,000 babies a year, just in the, in the five boroughs. Now, I know we talk about Ireland, six or 7,000 abortions in the whole country um, per year in this first year or second year of legalized abortion in Ireland. But can you imagine those numbers and how a young pro-lifer was wondering how you could take that on? Well, after holding um, in my arms a baby that I had helped rescue in an all black apartment house building in, in Brooklyn, and the mother being only 15 years old, I realized one man can make a difference. Now there are 2,700 pregnancy centers throughout the United States, and there are dozens in Ireland. These are the frontline forces for the rescues of children uh, in the United States and in many countries around the world. And I have uh, had a half a dozen trips to Ireland. I lived in England and traveled through Ireland in the late 70s. I have gone to numerous pro-life conferences. And in the week before the referendum in May of 2018 in Ireland over the Eighth Amendment, I did a vigil to Crow Patrick and did a freezing overnight um, up there in the chapel at the top of the mountain where St. Patrick's had a 40 day vigil and he didn't have a, a stone chapel to, to sleep in. And uh, I, I prayed very intensely that night with the Blessed Sacrament present. And I made a vigil to, um, our Lady of Knock as well. But I knew that freedom in the West is our hallmark and the Irish people chose poorly. Uh, and in many of the American states, um, millions of women and men have chosen very poorly. We've aborted over 62 million children in, in America. Um, so people with their free will, they make choices and they've made bad choices. So our movement has to be a movement of conversion and education and doing this face to face is critical to the movement's success. Doing it by inviting women in who are looking for ultrasound verifications of pregnancy, pregnancy tests, consultations, seeking out women on the sidewalks in front of abortion clinics. This these prayer vigils, these sidewalk counseling efforts have to be increased in both the United States and in Ireland. There has to be less timidity and more daring in the use of face-to-face -face direct action, prayer vigils and um, outreach, and then more service to the poor and mothers who have young children. This year during a, a COVID crisis, we. New York City uh, was the epicenter of uh, the American COVID crisis in the spring. And I endeavored and have carried out an effort to give away um, $1 million worth of essential goods to uh, poor young families. We have close to an 18% unemployment rate even now in the Bronx. Uh, many of these people don't get government benefits because they're not in the country legally. So anything we can give them, food, clothing, diapers, household supplies, um, vitamins, supplements, whatever we can get. We're working through Walmart and Amazon and, and Kimberly Clark, the diaper company, to give away, to help support the poor uh, young mothers. These are the kind of initiatives we've got to increase. Um, who knows where we're going legally? So much depends, as Catherine pointed out, on uh, and, and, and Father Stephen, as to who is the next president of the United States. It certainly looks like it's a long shot for President Trump to be reelected, re but who knows? We all can believe in miracles. Uh, it's going to be a tough four years if it's President Biden. 
And it's going to be a challenge for the pro-life movement. We suffered through eight years of Barack Obama. So we can get through four years of, of, of Biden if necessary. But this is a time where we must share ideas between our Irish, British, and American brothers and sisters. I look forward to uh, a future trip to meet uh, uh, T.D. Uh, Tobin and, uh, and to do what I can for the Irish uh, to visit, invite you to inspect our operations in New York City. Stay with us after you get your vaccination and clear JFK. Uh, we'd love to have you here. And I'd love to go back over to my homeland where 72% of my ancestors are from. Uh, I didn't have an Irish grandparent, but great grandparents. So I can't claim Irish citizenship, but my wife can, and then maybe I can get in that way. Anyway, back to you, John. Thanks from New York City. And no, that is not a real fire behind me. That's a fake. <laughs> well, Eileen Slattery will get you the uh, passport set up. Eileen Slattery, <laughs> right? I no, That's you're, right. You're, 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 I forget her sir or maiden uh, name. Tierney. Eileen was Tierney. Yes. Tierney, Tierney. Yeah, we, we, me and Chris banter about our Irish roots and all that. We have a lot of fun doing that. As I say, that, we have a lot of crack. Daniel O'Connell is national president of the ancient order of Hibernians. We are genuinely, truly delighted he can join us tonight as the AOH is a very important and significant Irish American fraternal organization. The AOH has deep and long roots in America and in Ireland. They have a huge membership all over America. They do good work and are deeply involved in Irish affairs. Dan, we appreciate how you at the last moment were able to schedule uh, things with the board to make it tonight. You made a special effort and I know you're going to give a great presentation. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'd like to also thank all of our speakers here today. John, for the invitation to participate on behalf of the Ancient Order of Hibernians in America. Father Stephen, for your opening prayer and beautiful words about your life and your efforts uh, for pro-life, our protest priest, as he said. Catherine and Chris, for your leadership in uh, American uh, United for Life and EMC Frontline Pregnancy Centers, respectively, um, as well as the words you shared today. I was glad I wasn't following Catherine. And, uh, Peter, you're lucky that I'm going before you because she was dynamite. Uh, yes dynamite great words and uh, something we could all learn about with public speaking the ancient order of hibernians america was founded in 1836 and is the largest and oldest irish catholic organization in the united states today we have members in each of the 50 states as well as washington dc as a matter of fact a very active uh, pro-life uh, division in uh the washington dc overall our purpose has evolved tremendously over the years, but began with protecting the Irish Catholic clergy and Irish immigrants uh, who came into the United States. As with every immigrant uh, population coming to America, we too had very difficult life surviving in America and bringing uh, Catholicism with us into a um, country that had very little, if any, Catholicism at the time. And as we worked, Together, we've uh, established the base for Irish American uh, way of life that we have today. Our support and tie to the clergy remains today, as just today we awarded our Project St. Patrick's grants, which we do annually to those answering the call to vocations as seminarians and religious orders. I believe we are still protecting the clergy as we support the vocations and help backfill um, such a tremendous need that we have in the United States and the, uh, around the world for uh, more uh, priests and uh, nuns to uh, help uh, guide, our, guide our way as we move forward. The attraction of the AOH is in part because the umbrella we have is of our order is so large and comprehensive. As I said, we are Irish Catholic Americans. Uh, that's right in our logo, right out on Front Street. But we are also Irish history and culture whether it's music, whether it's festivals, whether it's um, 
you name it, we're, we're, we're doing it. Uh, Feshes, we support it all. We are Freedom for Ireland. Uh, Pater talked about how similar we are to his uh, party. We're working on a regular basis for United and Free Ireland still today. You would think that we'd be able to put that uh, charge on the back burner, but still today we're working for that United and Free Ireland. And we all know so well the words of uh, Patrick Pierce, Ireland unfree shall never be at peace. We are missions and charities, supporting those in need in our communities from around the country. We are Catholic action, supporting our mother church at every turn. We are, of course, pro-life. We are political education, encouraging civic participation throughout the year. We are veterans affairs, helping and supporting those who have served America. We are immigration. We have been immigration from day one, and we continue to work on a fair and equitable immigration policy between the uh, United States and Ireland. We are the ancient order of Hibernian. Everything Irish, Catholic, and American, we cover under our umbrella. And it really opens the door because we have a spot for everyone. Today, of course, we're here to speak about our pro-life work. We believe in life, born and unborn, from conception to natu natural death. We believe in the science of life. During COVID-19, we heard our president-elect say time and time again, we will follow the science when he was talking about COVID-19. We will, in all of the pro-life community, should remind our president-elect time and time again that the science says life begins at conception. You can't pick and choose when you want to use science as your rationale. Our pro-life platform is based on our Catholic faith. It really goes back to Genesis chapter 1, where we learn that each and every person is created in the image and likeness of God. The fact that abortion not only affects the baby, but the mother and the father, hardening their hearts in ways that they might not understand or know for years to come. We, we are speaking to the dignity of life. The dignity of life confronts the utilitarian mentality with which our society often approaches what it means to be human. The belief that if we are not useful, then we are useless. We would urge that every life as inher has inherent value and that when we fail to appreciate one life, we fail to value every human life. Our work on the pro-life uh, issues has continued to expand. And, and what's really exciting is so many of our younger members are bringing uh, new action to uh, the pro-life. Uh, the number of Hibernians that uh, attend the uh, annual pro-life march continues to um, expand every year to the point that the last two years we've had bagpipers to lead us and, and help keep us together. One of my personal um, enjoyment is when I look at the people marching down and I see the young people, the high school students, the college students, and it tells us that our efforts over, um, over the years haven't, um, haven't gone to naught, and we're so proud of that is. Um, but the march is great, but we know that the work we do must continue throughout the year. We pray for those who support abortion, assisted suicide, the death penalty, asking God to change their hearts. Our other activities, uh, mostly related to Ireland here, because that was our focus, was we had a, a gentleman named Peter Tobin speak at our national convention. And he uh, was our keynote speaker on the pro-life topic, actually scheduled in Florida, as he mentioned when we were talking before the event. Uh, we moved it virtually to Youngstown, Ohio. And he said since it was virtual, he would come to Youngstown, where we are today in my uh, actual, my local division meeting is going on as we speak. But I can tell you all, we're in for a special moment. Um, I don't know if he could hold the bar as high as uh, Catherine did, but um, I'm looking forward to hearing P Peter's words. But for years, we supported the pro-life movement in the United States and Ireland. I remember working as far back as 2012 with Lifehouse Ireland. Uh, mm -hmm. And their battle at that time was with the abortion ship uh, off the coast of Dublin. And we supported that cause uh, wholeheartedly. 
our very first virtual speaker, I think was in 2012. And it was a, a young lady from, uh, um, from Lifehouse Ireland on behalf of uh, their work. And we use Skype. So we've come a long way as we're moving into Zoom today. But um, I will never forget that and the words she said. And uh, the membership, you could have heard a pin, pin drop. They were on the edge of their seats and learning about the successes they had and, and, and um, getting the young women to understand there was another option besides getting on that ship, going out into national, international waters and having an abortion. But we battled with our friends and our family for, for them and with them, depending on who it was, and trying to save the Eighth Amendment. In fact, when we sent out our email blast to over 15,000 people, mysteriously, 50% of our members unsubscribed. We were told by the company we were using that it was a, a glitch in the system. Now, we had sent out hundreds of email blasts, yet when we sent out um, a pro-Eighth Amendment email blast, it automatically unsubscribed. And then they were kind enough to tell us that by law, we could not add those members back in. And so we actually had to switch and go to another um, email provider, Constant Contact, which has been great with us since. We also brought Scott Shittle, I know some of you know, to speak mm -hmm. at our National Convention on Work, about, or in New York, I should say, about his work with Lifehouse Ireland, uh, an American who spent years working in Dublin with Lifehouse Ireland. The list goes on and on, and it'll go on into the future. Our national chairman for pro-life is Larry Squires from Pennsylvania. His name is quickly becoming a household word in the AOH. He's done more in the last uh, six months than I could have ever expected. Everyone can expect to hear more and more from Larry Squires as we continue our, our mission now and into the future. What a great opportunity we have here to work with and learn from each each other and have an opportunity to share with like-minded people in our efforts to respect life today and into the future. I want to thank you one more time, John, and, and back to you for our keynote speaker. Uh, Daniel, thank you very much. Um, you were terrific. Um, in fact, all the speakers have been terrific. I just um, very impressed. Well, our keynote is Pader Tobin TD. He is leader of Into. Ireland's pro-life and fastest growing political party. And it recently got a really tremendous boost from the latest polling numbers in Ireland showing a surge in grassroots support. Into is a relatively new party and in that short space of time has succeeded in electing candidates at the local and national level. Pala represents, I believe I'm correct, uh, Mead West constituency in Ireland. So that's really just a stone's throw from my old hometown of RD. We're quite, we're neighbours basically, Pala. Right? That's right. As long as you don't throw stones, I'll be your neighbour. <laughs> <laughs> I'll drop in for the tea and a pint. Um, it's been a busy past few days for N2, uh, there have been very sad stories, Pader, out of Ireland, and uh, you'll be telling us a lot more, uh, you know, the bigger picture as well, but terrible stories of uh, late-term abortions. I, I think they're actually horrific. I, I find it difficult to believe this is the Ireland I left, and in a sp few, few short years of time, we have come to this barbaric way of of life, culture. I don't believe it's the will of the people, but you can speak to that. Pader, thank you for coming. You're up late at night. Um, it's past midnight, the wee hours. For people who have joined us, we're now live on YouTube. Um, we created a link, which I uh, sent to one of your YouTube members, and we're also available um, by phone. Uh, Pader, again, thank you for coming. Um, and we wish you an end to Godspeed in the future. Well, first of all, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I am so grateful uh, that you've given me this platform to talk to yourselves uh, and to many of the members and supporters uh, in the United States of America. Um, and the fact that I'm the keynote speaker here with so many phenomenal speakers, um, 
I'm, 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 I'm shocked, to be honest, uh, and I really am really so proud to be here with you. I want to thank yourself, uh, John, first and foremost, uh, for helping to organize this event here. And I thank uh, Father Stephen, uh, Catherine, Chris, and Daniel for their in, in really important work that they're doing and their insights that they've shared with us here uh, tonight. Uh, and I'm delighted to hear such positive news from yourself, Catherine, uh, with what's going on in the United States. And it does lift our, our spirits here when we see that you know, things can be changed. And, um, and Chris, you know, the work that you do on a practical, you know, personal uh, level is, is absolutely wonderful there. And you know, that even if the fire is fake, it makes me feel warmer just looking at it, let me tell you. <laughs> But um, but listen, and I also want to say, you know, to thank um, yeah, Father Stephen for for his prayers, and and to say that I also know um, Daniel from uh, other conversations. You know, uh, Daniel has been kind enough to give us a, an opportunity to speak to the members of the Ancient Order of Avernians, uh, which has been one of the great friends of Ireland uh, for 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 decades uh, and and hundreds of years. So to thank um, Daniel for that work and to really encourage them to keep up the good work on that. And quickly, I suppose, just to introduce myself, my name is Pather Tobin. I'm a TD um, in Ireland uh, for the great county of Mead. A uh, TD is, the, is an Irish word, it's a chakta dola, which basically means a messenger of the people. So my job is to take the views of, and the interests and the needs of the Irish people in my constituency and bring that message to the parliament in Ireland, which is the, is the doll. So it's similar to what is a senator or, or congressman or woman in the United States. I was a member for, uh, of Sinn Féin for about 21 years. Many of you will know uh, who Sinn Féin are. Uh, I left them um, about two years ago just due to the radical change that they made in a number of key issues, uh, one of them being the rights to life. And uh, for me, the rights to life is such an important issue. It's not one of those issues where you can just, you know, uh, bury and sweep under the carpet and, and, and ignore. It's part of the very you know, essence of who we are is where our stance is on the issue uh, of the rights to life. So Aintu is, um, it, it's an Irish word. It means unity and it means the unity of the Irish people, north and south, um, the country and the people uh, of Ireland. And we were founded 24 months ago. So we're not even two years old. So as I say, if we were a, a, a child, we, we would be a toddler and you could knock us over. We're that young. Um, we are a 32 county uh, United Ireland party um, and we are committed to economic justice. And shockingly, and it's bad news, but we are now the only All-Ireland party that supports the right to life of everybody. It's not an incredible thing to say. You know, that sentence, supporting the right to life of everybody is now a minority um, uh, politics in Ireland at the moment, as far as the political makeup of the parties are concerned. And we are that party that holds that flag uh, right now uh, in Ireland. So just very briefly, if I can, I'll go through, you know, many of you will know what happened in Ireland uh, over the last five years. And I'll just give you, I suppose, my analysis of what uh, happened and, and how changed happened. So Ireland went probably from being one of the safest places in the world to be an unborn child, to probably now being one of the more dangerous places in the world to be an unborn uh, child. It has been changed, it's been, to be honest, happening over 30 or 40 years, but it definitely accelerated just in the last four to five years. And that acceleration, I think, happened for a number of reasons. And you know, some of my contributions might seem critical in relation to my own country, and I don't mean to be. Uh, I believe Ireland is a great country and a country that's worth fighting for. And that's why I suppose I'm so passionate with regards building this new political movement uh, in Ireland. Uh, but I suppose one of the, the, the most important ingredients in Ireland has been the media. Um, in America, you know, I know there's been a lot of uh, critique of the media in the States, but there is a left-wing media, there is a right-wing media, there is a liberal media, there's a conservative media. There is the same in Britain, there's the same in France, there's the same in most countries. In Ireland, it's different. We are a small media market here. And with the changes in the media over the last number of years, it's actually got smaller. It's a very concentrated market. There's only about six national companies and um, only about a thousand national journalists. They're typically from the same geographic area of the same age profile, and they're pretty uniform in their uh, political uh, outlook. So um, it means that they, are, they have a, 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 
they communicate a, a tip a, a particular view of the world and if you don't fit in with that particular view of that world you tend to get attacked or ignored uh, by the media in relation to your views and that's not to say that there are there are many decent and good journalists uh, in in Ireland who do good work uh, but in the main it is a very concentrated media space and um, there's been big political changes that have happened in Ireland over the last number of years as many of you know, there's been, there was a big crash that happened about 10 years ago. And that crash dislocated uh, and um, so many people. First of all, people, about 30% of the country lost jobs and um, they lost um, their houses. They lost, you know, all of their, their savings. And because of that, they lost faith in the political establishment as it existed at the time. And... Um, I suppose some of the smaller parties of the hard left took political advantage of that. And my former party, Sinn Féin, took a sudden, a sudden swing as well uh, to the hard left, probably to capitalise on those political changes that were happening. The two other political parties became what I would call ideological husks. So in other words, they had no core anymore uh, with regards to their, their, their political views. And because of that change the most important political tool that existed in Ireland at that time for survival was literally this, a finger in the air to find out which way the wind is blowing and then to go in that particular direction. So many of the foundational uh, political objectives were washed away uh, in that uh, uh, period of time. Um, so those factors had a big change in how the political system in Ireland worked. <clears throat> and they led to change. And I think there's one other little factor that is often forgotten about uh, in Ireland, in that there developed also a very well-funded, very well-organized, to be honest, very hardworking, and very politically strategic pro-choice or abortion campaign in Ireland. Many of those received funds uh, from international sources, uh, and they focused very particularly over the years on the number of cases um, and you know very quickly the, the discussions in Ireland started to focus on really difficult cases that do exist in society and that make many people second guess their understanding of the right to life um, but as we know that once the, um, the, the political uh, organization started to change in that direction and once they lost their foundations or their roots on the right to life, very quickly then uh, the, the discussion changed to basically abortion for any reason uh, whatsoever. In the North, change uh, also happened. And the North would be slightly different. It wouldn't have had the same political experiences that we had in the South. But in the North, the abortion regime was imposed by the British government um, with, in partnership with Sinn Féin and the SDLP. So... In the South at the moment, abortion is legal for any reason, up to 12 weeks uh, gestational age for the unborn child. And abortion is legal in certain circumstances uh, in late term situations. Most typically in uh, the situation of where there's a life limiting condition or where abortion campaigners call fetal fatal abnormalities. And um, so this is a situation uh, where the child has a, a very significant and very serious disability and it is a very serious challenge uh, for families. Um, but, you know, there's been a case just recently um, that I have been fighting for of a, an illegal abortion in an Irish hospital of a healthy child who was misdiagnosed uh, to have one of these life-limiting conditions. Uh, and yet it hasn't gained any of the political or media attention uh, that you would expect. So when the change happened a number of years ago, we had probably a decade of this issue being a hot political topic, seldom off the, the front page of the newspapers, seldom out of the news. But now that the system has been bedded in uh, for over 18 to two, two months to two years, it's practically invisible um, and makes the headlines very, very seldom. So what was the change? The change was that abortion was legalized and within one year, the rate jumped by 40%. So like the States, actually, the abortion rate in the South of Ireland had been dropping for the last 30 years. Um, but the abortion rate jumped by 40%. And 
in one year to 6,666 lives lost in his first year. So that's, I suppose, that fact gives the lie to the argument that was being made that by legalizing in, in Ireland, you were just allowing for women to do the same thing that they were already doing in Britain. The argument was that you were just, you know, displacing it to Ireland rather than Britain, that no numbers would change. But in actual fact, in making access either, easier, in making it legal and changing, I suppose, the, the, the moral outlook uh, on the issue, um, you had a, a, a massive increase in the number of people uh, who lost their lives according to uh, abortion, uh, according to uh, the law on abortion. So uh, as John you know, alluded to in his introduction there, uh, it's just in the last number of weeks, a report was published in a journal of obstetrics in Britain, which interviewed a number of Irish doctors. Um, and you know, those doctors indicated themselves that they were physically shocked and shaken by the actions that they were asked to do in administering a late-term abortion. And one doctor indicated that he had vomited on the corridor, such was mm. the natural human, I suppose, instinct when uh, life has been extinguished uh, in, in such a situation. And there, you know, the language was being used of a, an injection being inserted into the heart of a child to induce a heart attack in that child. And the lack of pain relief being given to uh, the unborn child. Um, and also that when a child survives an abortion, maybe extremely injured, maybe fatally injured, but still alive, um, not knowing whether or not um, health uh, care would be afforded to that child, or not knowing whether or not palliative care would be afforded to that child. So, you know, and that child is a citizen of the country a citizen of this fine republic that we live in and, and that, you know, articulates the, uh, the objective of equality uh, all of the time. And yet equal access to palliative care or treatment um, is not a given with regards uh, these uh, children who survive uh, abortion in that situation. And um, so again, that particular report, you know, literally no media attention, invisible to most people, I would say, Easily 80% of the population of this, of, of this state never heard anything about that particular document whatsoever. So um, we've raised it um, we, we, in, in the doll. We have uh, forced the government to answer questions on it. Um, and we will look now to draw up a bill a le of legislation to see can we at least bring in that some level of humanitarianism into the process um, as such. Um, so where are we now politically? I suppose after the referendum, about 40% of the population did vote against the change in the law. Uh, and, you know, it, it's interesting, and, and this goes back to what John was saying, there was an exit poll carried out on the day of the referendum. And the exit polls in Ireland are quite detailed. Uh, so they have massive samples and they asked people what was the motivating factor for, on which they voted. Uh, and the majority of people who voted yes for abortion did so only on the really difficult cases. The really difficult cases um, such as uh, rape, uh, incest, uh, or uh, life-limiting conditions. And that was the reason why the majority of people voted. But what they got was a regime legislation which was far broader, far more extreme uh, than that. Um, and that 40% of the population voted, another 40% of the population voted against that itself. There was a political void created because none of the political parties um, articulated or supported that view uh, anymore, that rights to life view. Um, and we felt, a number of us felt, that we had to leave our political parties and to make sure that we gave a voice, a vehicle, so that this um, really important human rights view could be worked for uh, in future. Now, um, a lot of us left Sinn Féin, people left Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael, uh, Labour and, and some of the other political parties. And now we've built a political organisation across the country, a grassroots organisation across the country with well over a thousand members. And in Irish terms, that that's a large number of members for a political party. Uh, we have fought 
so many elections in our, 20, in our 23 months. We fought two general elections, one north and one south, two local elections, one north and one south. We, we fought a Senate election and local elections uh, as well. We have, um, right now, we have six elected reps across the country from Derry in the north to Wexford in the south. Uh, well over a thousand members at this stage, local branches of our organization right through the country. Um, and we have membership joining us uh, at a serious rate at the moment. Um, in Ireland, I suppose we've probably taken a slightly different strategy or tack than, than many of the contributors have uh, communicated so far. In America, I suppose you have a binary political system in general. You have two major political parties and it's very hard to create a political alternative outside of, of that system. And Ireland is a little bit different. We have a multi-party situation. It is easier to create um, a, 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 another political view. Now, when I say easier, I mean, it's easier in the United States, but it's not easy. It is definitely hard. It's a lot of hard work. And indeed, every pundit in this country uh, said it would be impossible. And they completely said, there's no way that AIM2 would get off the ground. And now we're polling at the same levels as political parties such as the Greens, as the Labour Party. The, like the Labour Party's around for 100 years, the Greens are around for decades. These parties get hundreds of thousands of euros worth of funding, have dozens of staff, you know, have you know, elected reps to beat the band. And yet our small tribe of committed people are already having the same impact on the political situation as these individuals, which is, which is fantastic. Um, and I suppose just to, to, to sh talk to you very briefly about um, our strategy. In Ireland, uh, we found that there are many great pro-life people uh, in the country, but they're not politicized. And that's a major weakness uh, uh, for ourselves to create change. So the truth of the matter is 95% of Irish people, and it's probably the same in the States, they vote with their wallets. So they vote on whether or not they can feed their family, whether they can put a roof over their family, provide education and health care with their family. So in political terms, if you're not talking to them about those issues, if you're not providing solutions to them on those issues and working harder than your competitors on those issues, you're actually not at the races at all. And that's really important to understand. And we have a job of work to really get that through to people of similar views to ourselves uh, throughout um, the country. And we are getting there at the moment. Uh, and if we keep this momentum um, and the next election comes along, we'll be able to crystallize that level of support. And I have no doubt that we'll be able to bring a large number of other elected reps uh, into the fold, which will give us a phenomenal impact. And it will probably prevent the media from trying to ignore us uh, uh, currently as, as is their strategy at the moment. So what are we about? I suppose the, the, the three pillars and, and the, the pillar that we're here to discuss tonight is the unborn child, you know, and we believe that the unborn child is an individual living human being. Um, he or she is as individual as any of us here. He or she is as alive as anybody here. And they are as human as anybody uh, is here. And that is a scientific fact that can't be denied by anybody on the planet. The truth of the matter is as well that the, the unborn child is the weakest and most vulnerable of all human life. And it's, 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 it's interesting to me that most people now get to meet their unborn child for the first time as about the 12 week scan. And that's at least in Ireland, that's the, the, the time for the first scan. And most people have a photograph, the first photograph of their child at the 12 week scan in their house at the moment. So with modern technology, we're actually getting to know the wonder of that human life at a far younger age. And I also believe that human life is the most valuable thing that we have. If, you know, it's the most important human rights. If you delete the right to life, no other right is guaranteed at all. Uh, in actual fact, all the other human rights are taken away uh, from you as well. And, and the other point that I would say is that human rights by definition are universal. If you take a sector of society out of any human right, by definition, it's no longer a human right. It's a sectoral right. And you know we need to make sure that if we're gonna talk about human rights at all, that we must make sure that they are universal. Um, I suppose 
in, in, in our view here, we've taken the view that, um, that abortion is one of the most grievous forms of discrimination. Uh, and I think that's a really important message to communicate. Uh, and one of, one of the examples of that is right around the world, uh, if you have a disability, you are far more likely to, to be aborted than if you don't have a disability. Imagine we're in the 21st century and we have people with disabilities forming organizations such as Don't Screen Us Out. This is an organization that operates in Britain and its desire is to try and communicate to the greater public not to screen out children with disabilities. But it, the fact that an organization such as that has to exist in our time, we think we're probably the most enlightened generation to yet inhabit this planet of ours. But yet we have people who are pleading with us not to screen this out. Um, you know, in, in, in many countries now, 90% of unborn children who are diagnosed with Down syndrome are aborted. They don't make it uh, to birth. And it's expected in many countries, uh, such as um, Britain and, and Sweden and France, that in soon there will be no children born with disabilities unless it's by accident, or no children born with Down syndrome unless it's by accident. That is a shocking level of dis discrimination. In the Netherlands, the Minister for Health was asked uh, around the issue of uh, disabilities. And the Minister for Health, a previous one, stated, if freedom of choice results in a situation that nearly no children with Down syndrome are being born, society should accept that. Now, that's a sentence that I would have expected from the first half of the 20th century, not the second half of the 20th century. Um, now, obviously, for the children that that's involved in, that's a catastrophic result. That's the end of their lives. But actually, for the rest of society, is radically poor as a result because the richness of humanity is removed, is eroded as a result of that. And then we have the issue of gender selection abortion. And this is where it's estimated that about 100 million women are missing throughout the world because of gender selection abortion and infanticide. In countries such as China and the US and Britain, um, you know, some parents for economic and social and cultural reasons seek sons. And if they have an unborn girl on the way, they abort that child. Um, it's an incredible thing. It also discriminates against races and ethnic backgrounds. And, you know, I've looked at statistics and, and Chris had mentioned statistics in the five boroughs of, of New York, but other statistics have shown that African-American babies are, born, are, are aborted at a far higher rate in, the, in, in New York. And I think th yeah. there was a number of years where more oh, African-American sure. babies were aborted than actually made it to term. Yeah. yeah. A phenomenal statistic. Um, and in a, in a country that pleads for Black Lives Matters, you know, it's incredible that the truth of the matter is that abortion rates are heavily skewed against, against ethnic minorities. And abortion also discriminates against poor people. In, in the US, in, in, in Scotland and other countries, if you are poor, you're far more likely to be aborted. 75% of all unborn children aborted in the US come from either poor or low income backgrounds. So, you know, it's, it's, it's funny because in, in this country, we have many parties, probably of the economic rights, and they say they are pro-choice, but the economic factors that they are actually creating make women feel that they have no choice. And I actually think, and, and one of our views as a party is, one of the best ways that we can give women positive choices is to actually create that economic justice um, so that they have economic options open to them. Another, obviously, pillar of Aintu is that of Irish unity. And as I said, it means the word unity. We are an Irish Republican political party. Some of you will have heard of Wolf Tone. Uh, and Wolf Tone wanted to create an Ireland of Catholic, Protestant and dissenter so that we could have a pluralist country where people from different backgrounds, uh, from faith and of none, can work together in peace and prosperity. We're also practical Republicans. And we have been bringing bills in front of the doll which seek to give speaking rights and debating rights to MPs who are elected in the north of Ireland, but in our doll in the south, because we want to take down the border. We see the border actually as like a wall with a thousand blocks. Each block actually stands 
for a difficulty caused in Ireland. So, for example, we want to create an all-Ireland ambulance service so simply people can get to hospital faster. If we do that, we take down a block and we improve people's lives. We want to create a, an all-Ireland cardiac service so that you know, people in Donegal can actually achieve healthcare in Derry and in Belfast closer to them than having to travel to Dublin to achieve it. An all-Ireland education system, an all-Ireland um, um, economy, which will actually allow for greater uh, business and jobs and prosperity to be achieved. So each one of those blocks is a positive contribution in real terms and practical terms to people's lives now, but it reduces the height of the border and actually makes unity easier on that sunny day when it does uh, 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 finally come. I also want to say we are a party of justice too, and many will, will know that Ireland has suffered great injustices uh, at the hands of the British over the years. And we have commemorated 100 years of Bloody Sunday um, in, in Dublin, which happened uh, during the War of Independence, where British soldiers shot randomly into uh, a crowd of football supporters and football players, killing uh, 14 uh, on that day. Um, and one of our councillors, actually the deputy leader of our party, is a councillor, Denise Mullen, from the north of Ireland. And um, her father was shot 40 years ago um, by a loyalist terrorist backed by the British Army. Um, she was only four years old in the house. She had to wait with her father as he died and bled to death until the, um, the security forces uh, came uh, with um, the ambulance as well. So there's still a legacy of great injustice that exists uh, in this, this country in which we want to achieve justice. We also want to achieve reconciliation because we know that everybody in this country has a right to be here and everybody has a significant part to play in our future. And we need to be able to work in peace and harmony with everybody. And the last thing that I will say is that we are, I believe, the party of the Irish diaspora Irish America has played a phenomenally important role in the development of this country, both pre-independence and since the independence of the South of Ireland. The struggle for Irish freedom would not have happened without our brothers and sisters uh, in the United States. Irish America was pivotal also for the Good Friday uh, Agreement. The Good Friday Agreement would not have happened uh, without uh, Irish America. And I will say that the Irish, uh, the ancient order of Hibernians, you know, deserve absolutely significant and special mention in the role that has been played in all of those elements. Absolutely. Um, and you know, I'm just, it's amazing, I think, that the ancient order of Herbertians have managed to be able to, to continue to harness that goodwill that exists amongst our diaspora in the States. But I do believe that the relationship has to be two-way. And I don't think the Irish government and many of the Irish establishment recognise our responsibility to reach out to Irish America. And that's why I would love, if it's possible, if we can get volunteers to help us, people of, of, of good character with energy in the same politics as ourselves. I'd love to set up, if we can, a Cordia Aintu. Cordia is the Irish word for friendship and friends of Aintu in the United States. So these are people uh, who have a common goal, a common objective, a common desire, um, to see the same, um, the same human rights, you know, achieved both in the United States and uh, in Ireland uh, and who can support us in many ways here in Ireland. Because I don't believe that we can achieve what we want to achieve without the greater Irish uh, family that exists uh, in the States. And what I would like to see is, you know, elected representatives from aim to traveling to the United States on a regular basis and for a number of reasons. First and foremost, to sit with Irish Americans and listen. Not to talk, like I'm doing now, but to listen and to hear back from the needs of Irish Americans uh, with regards how this relationship uh, should work. To build that relationship, to commemorate the fallen uh, who have come from America uh, in, in, in Irish freedom struggles uh, and to remember them and to build those uh, relationships uh, further. I also believe that um, our common goals are probably the most important human rights goals that exist in our generation. Um, and, you know, I want to speak from um, this side of the pond that we appreciate all the work that you are doing for us. 
I believe that Ain2 is probably unique. I believe it's the most important political vehicle that exists in Ireland for generations. Um, and I also will say this, I don't believe anybody's coming after us. I don't see it possible for any organization to gain the momentum that we've achieved in the future. Uh, I believe that this is our chance and that we all need to grab it with both hands. Uh, thank you, Tyler. Um, you gave us a lot to think about and ponder. And uh, you talked about the American side, Ireland, and the connections between both countries and the legacy there. Um, I, we'll open it up so we kind of engage each other. I think the practical thing to do with the amount of time we've left is to maybe exchange ideas. You mentioned, Father, about cooperation and uh, Catherine Glenn Foster in Washington um, is very involved on the legal side of pro-life. And in my way of thinking, that's critical to understand the laws and to move a lot of mountains. Chris is involved, you know, on the uh, ground level um, with his support services. The AOH is a hugely influential role to play. And we father Stephen and Murata, um, who's done a lot of work already in Ireland and plans to go back. Um, how, how can we deepen our, you know, our bonds, I suppose? That's what I want to put out there. And I have a second follow-up to that. It has been said to me in the past, of course, you know where this is coming from, that uh, it's none of Irish America's business to be involved in Ireland's affairs. But that usually only occurs as a comment when it comes to, you know, the pro-life issue. Uh, Ireland, Irish America's involvement is always welcomed at other critical moments. We had the Good Friday Peace Agreement, even the foundation of the Irish state. Um, and the American, America was the first nation, I believe, to recognize the Irish, uh, quote unquote, free state. And um, Eamon de Valera, of course, who was the first president of Ireland and founded Sinn Féin, was born in New York City. And I'm sure if he was alive today, Padder, he would be aghast at some of the um, humanitarian and, and, and social injustices in Ireland and the corrosion in life. And I must say, I congratulate you for taking on a lot of issues, social issues. You even took on this issue of, you know, being pornography being available to youngsters. Uh, congratulations. That's a brave issue to take, but you're able to debate these issues. So just throwing it, throwing it out to everybody to come up with any ideas and maybe some calls to action, maybe simple things rather than be all over the map. Anybody want to step up here? Peter, uh, well done, uh, Danny here. Uh, I just heard from Sean Pender, and he made a great point. He said, you know, we've talked about how you can't pick science when it's convenient. <laughs> and you talk about... Um, you know, the vulnerability of the uh, unborn and the, and the human rights issues. And, and so we want human rights, but not when it affects, uh, when it suits you. And we work closely on uh, a lot of issues very similar to what your party has with Chris Smith. And Chris is very big on the issues uh, that uh, gender selection and um, how that is so, what you exactly, what you mentioned there and tied into both of those. And he gets called anti-woman when he, when he talks about those issues. What is the affront that you're facing in Ireland when you talk about the issues in regard to human rights is okay on one hand, but when it comes to the human rights of the unborn, it's not. What is the uh, objection you're facing there? I mean, here it's just simply he's anti-woman, which is absurd. Yeah, so thanks, uh, Daniel, for that. Um, there's a couple of things. I do believe that modern society is engages a lot in what I call hollow arguments. So in other words, you know, and if, if it's the right to life, you know, it's, or even the United Ireland, some in Ireland will say, you know, what, what are these Irish Americans who know nothing about what's happening here? How dare they get involved in our politics? But then if, if it's about, you know, the development of our economy or the Good Friday Agreement, they go, no, absolutely Irish America should be involved. Or, you know, if it's, and it, so in other words, people yeah. will use, um, an argument specifically about if it suits their political agenda at the time 
And then they will flip their argument if it does not suit their political agenda at the time. And, and I, I think that shows a weakness and a lack of consistency. They get away with it because the, 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 the media and the political discussion is now what I call like nearly like MTV discussions. It's kind of you know, 30 second sound bites and that, you know, you know, don't get it into the depth of the information at all. One of the things that we have, have looked at here, Daniel, you know, I get attacked by my, uh, the most extreme side of the other debate for the same reason. They will say that I am anti-woman. I will make the argument uh, that in actual fact, you know, um, abortion significantly is an attack on women and gender selection abortion itself is an, an example of that. You are more likely to be aborted if you're female. And that, that is uh, the fact. Never mind the damage that is done to so many women who have had abortions themselves. Um, even though that story is, is kept under the carpet too. The other way that we, we battle that is we make sure that we fight for lots of other issues that are really important to women as well. And we make sure that we have credibility on all of those issues too. So, you know, I find that, and, and I'm, this, this might, might be your experience in the States, I find that sometimes pro-lifers in Ireland haven't fought against homelessness enough. They haven't fought against, you know, um, a lack of health care uh, enough. They haven't fought for the vulnerable enough. And I think if you can build your political name on working hard on those issues, you gain a political credibility that can't be undercut then by those childish allegations that you're anti-women. You know, if you have worked hard for lots of other aspects of women's health and safety. They can't do that to you as easy, if you know what I mean. And I think that's important. And the other really important point that I have felt, you know, if we stood on a right to life issue alone, we would never be able to break beyond one or 2%. Because even in, in, our, in Ireland, it's different in the States, I think. Even many, most right to life people of instincts still don't vote that way. They vote on the basis of who's going to do the best economic deal for them. It's kind of like what Clinton said, it's the economy stupid. Do you remember that, that statement he mentioned there? And that's very important. So I actually, one of the biggest issues that I have to communicate with in, in, in our kind of support base and membership is, listen guys, if we don't do better on those issues than our competition, we're not gonna be able to work on those other issues either. Um, and I think strategically, in the Irish context, that's enormously important. Um, fascinating, Father. <laughs> Maybe Catherine or, or Chris or a father could come in on this. You mentioned it a few times in your in your presentation about it has to be broader than pro life. I, I agree with you. I think anybody that's pro life has to be pro humanitarian in all its manifestations, totally agree with you. And so you might say there's a certain level of hypocrisy if that does not exist. But in the US context, I would dare say demographically, most Irish, Irish Americans have the, um, are democratic by genetic disposition. And certainly most Irish started their lives here in America as Democrats. They moved in mass since Roe v. Wade to the Republican Party out of sheer disgust. And there could be other issues involved, social mobility, we get all that. But it's in that sense, we may be different than Ireland. I think for a lot of Americans, especially on the evangelical side, it's a single issue. They're single issue voters, mm -hmm. uh, pro-life. Uh, maybe somebody could come in on that, Catherine or Father, because it's a, it's a very, an important thing to understand. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, just a couple of comments. Go ahead, Catherine. Uh, just a couple of quick comments on that. For so many Americans, this is, uh, they are single issue voters because this is the most fundamental human right we have. A, a couple of speakers have mentioned this. If you don't have the right to life, what rights do you have? What rights can you exercise? And so we do see political shifts often due to that. Um, 
we also know from, from polling and from just conversations with ordinary Americans that most people understand that when you pass a pro-life law, that when you enact a pro-life policy, that what you're doing is protecting mother and child, that you are protecting both, that it is a pro-woman stance to be pro-life. Most people get that. I mean, a super majority of Americans we're talking about get that. Even self-described pro-choice Americans, even Democrats. And so um, looking at those figures, looking at those statistics, what we see is that in many cases, it's party leadership who are swaying the party platform, who are turning the party, but that's they're not listening to their constituents, and that's the mistake. And that, I believe, is where, in large part, we're going to win, even on the political front, because the more people uh, get to know this issue, and it's more and more in the public, uh, in the public media, in the public consciousness, the more people get to know it, the more people get to the heart of the reality of it, and not just the political terms that, that we bandy about, not just pro-life, pro-choice, those are a little politicized, but when people get to know what abortion really is, and what people, what taxpayers are being asked to fund, we just had a hearing on this yesterday, the more they they are pro-life and they support life and they support women. And, um, and that's one of the ways in which this is a winning issue for us. Anybody want to come in? Yes, I'd like to add that there's been a, a tradition amongst Irish Americans to, to join the party of their parents and their grandparents, the Democrat party. Mm -hmm. um, I have a volunteer who works uh, with us probably 12 hours a week um her father is an irish american and she um brought him an absentee ballot and to her chagrin uh he voted all the way down the line a democrat on his ballot and he's in a, a wheelchair and he's he's uh not well but this is not untypical of Many union members who have been traditionally amongst the Irish community, Democrat, you know, we also now, we don't have the Irish American politicians that so much made up New York. And they, and in, in cities like New York and Philadelphia and, and Boston, where there were high concentrations of Irish Americans, now you have uh, African Americans and and Latino Americans who are um, in charge. Uh, and yet, nevertheless, when they, these uh, people bring in um, new um, ethnic backgrounds, they tend to be in our major cities, Democrats. And it's just as a habit that so many of the Irish have voted Democrat their whole lives. And the American media, now that uh, it's quite probable that uh, a Catholic president will be in the White House who is pro-abortion, the American media will not highlight this issue, not reminding Catholics uh, that this man is out of step uh, with the right to life. He has changed his position. I think we have to do much more in the Irish American community to acquaint our people with the position the Democrat Party takes versus the Republican Party. Uh, it, you know, it, it, it's, it's a crisis in Catholicism when your president in the United States advocates abortion till birth and every single state funding it with taxpayer dollars. It's an absolute scandal uh, that our bishops have not spoken up during this election about this. One retired archbishop who's actually Native American ancestry, Archbishop Chapu just recently said that uh, uh, President-elect uh, Biden should not be offered communion. But this is not 
an issue that uh, Irish Americans think about enough. I think we have an opportunity if, God forbid, Biden is the president on January 20th, where we have to reopen this issue with Irish Americans. I think I don't, I know that um, AOH cannot take a position, uh, party politics, but I think there must be open discussions on the moral issues that face Irish American Catholics, especially. Yeah, well, I think that's where AOH and fraternal organizations with Irish members uh, can do great work, Dan, um, strengthening our bonds, our family life, our, our pro-life values. Um, I wonder how we could translate that into uh, positive change in Ireland. And one thing that occurred to me in Padder probably is, uh, will be, he is familiar with this, the Irish government is, has been attempting to reach out to the diaspora. And there has always been talks and papers recently issued on um, <clears throat> a vote for the Irish abroad in the um, presidential election. Has that any value, Padder? Um, can it sway opinion? Should we be getting organized ahead of that now? Because when I <clears throat> read some of the government statements on it, they mentioned everything, all kind, kinds of diversity, except the <clears throat> no mention of the contributions over the centuries of Irish missionaries, lay people, uh, blue collar workers who worked with the poor in, 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 in neighborhoods in America. Um, nothing about, you know, the uh, Irish Americans who are pro-life <clears throat> and espouse the kind of values that the AOH, in fact, I didn't see much of a mention about the AOH in that fat, fat document. I suppose just it's important to kind of understand what's happened in Ireland over the, over the last while. So when I was a kid, um, there was probably, you know, 95% of Catholics attended, you know, weekly mass, uh, etc. Uh, that's down to about, you know, 35, 40 percent uh, currently, which is still far higher than other European countries. Um, but the level of, let's say, uh, participation is far lower than it was. Um, and also, you know, our, our, the, our, the Irish Catholic Church was rocked over a, a, a number of years by a, a large number of issues, which led to a big backlash in Irish society. Uh, and actually, many elements of Irish society now are very anti-clerical, uh, very anti, let's say, what nearly extreme, extreme secular uh, as such. And there is, it goes back to that, um, that, that, that mix of politics and media in Ireland in that everybody wants to exist in the same space. There, there isn't, you know, there are differences between the political parties for sure. There's, you know, there's left and there's right economically, but socially, most of the political spectrum now want to exist in exactly the same space. And, um, uh, you know, there's, as a result, these political parties don't pay any attention to that level of, that type of heritage that exists, that wonderful heritage that, that existed uh, from Ireland uh, over the years. And there's, there's hardly a nod now given to that. So um, now I do think things have stabilised with regards to uh, church attendance, uh, and the strength uh, of the church, but it is very much a minority space uh, in Irish politics and Irish culture and Irish society. And that's probably one of the contributing facts to the referendum uh, changing uh, as it did. Um, I suppose in, in, in political terms, one of the, the things that I would, I would say that if, if people wanted to help us uh, in the States, um, first of all, would be to talk to people at home in Ireland. Um, that you that you know of, you know what I mean. Um, to you know, follow us on social media, to you know, to communicate and help us learn and, and, and teach us and um, the skills, etc., that you have have, have built up uh, over the last number of years. You know, to help us get in touch and in contact with Irish American media, so that we can actually start to speak to hundreds of thousands uh, of Irish Americans, because many Irish Americans will have only heard of Sinn Féin and probably believe that Sinn Féin is the, the only political party that's fighting for, you know, Irish independence, full Irish independence. But that's actually not true. And, you know, the more, you know, conversation we can have with a broader Irish-American audience, 
uh, will give us more weight and more strength and, and more leverage uh, as well. And, um, you know, I, I think that would be important. And, and definitely that objective that I have, you know, I want AIM2 to, to set up a, an Irish-American branch in America in the early part of 2021. And I want to be able to send our elected representatives over in Easter um, to commemorate the Easter Rising uh, to three or four locations, if we can, in the States, so we can sit down physically with coffee, if that's possible, um, and have conversations with people to learn, to listen, uh, and to develop those relationships. Uh, I think that if we set that out as the objective of relationship building between our new movement and Irish America for the period of the next two or three years, I think in, 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 two or th in, in three years' time, we would then be able to harness the great wind of goodwill that exists in America for the campaigns that we're involved in here in Ireland. That I, um, two years ago, started a pro-life context in Ireland Facebook group, and we have 627 members. About a dozen uh, of the members are American pro-lifers, but... It's, it's a pretty good list of active pro-lifers in your country. So yeah, I'd like you to join website. that group. Yeah. John is uh, active with it. And we have been having a lot of dialogue between American and Irish pro-lifers with this group. And I'd like to come over and do whatever I can to be a go-between, uh, arrange meetings in New York City, as one of the uh, leading Irish American pro-lifers here and help uh, maybe network with some of the AOH divisions in New York City uh, that uh, uh, Daniel can put us in touch with. And, you know, we'll, we'd be happy to uh, help you network. John is excellent with media, as you know, he's a, he's a PR man and he has good contacts in the Irish media. I will say this, I think uh, Peter hit it on the head with, um, we need to be comprehensive pro-life organizations. We need to embrace the uh, politicians who might not be with us on abortion, but they're with us on health care. They're with us on taking care of the poor. They're with us on taking care of the elderly. We cannot simply be pro-life when it comes to abortion. And I think one of the things um, Catherine hit on, which was dead on, is so many of our politicians their pro-life policy is based on, uh, on, on the leadership and what they're told. And um, I think that the super PACs have come in, you know, it wasn't long ago, we had uh, 90 pro-life Democrats. And uh, you either had you either changed your stance or the uh, party brought money in and elected another Democrat. Several incumbents have... Uh, been beat because of their pro-life stance. So I think we need to be looping in that, hey, what you're doing here is pro-life. We do need to help uh, the elderly because it's a, it's, a, it's a slippery slope. If we want to be one issue, and I think our success comes from not only are we involved uh, politically for things like a United Ireland, and as Peter said, we need to support all these issues to build the credibility. Um, and I think that that's... Uh, that's very important if we if it it's it's yes we are anti-abortion but we are also um you know anti-death penalty and mm -hmm. you, you sit there and you look at it and you say well we want to support this person because they're um they're anti-abortion yet they have a hundred percent voting record on the death penalty yeah you, you, you can't have it both ways and i think that's one of the problems with when we pick, when we isolate and drill down to one issue on the uh, pro-life cause, we have to be comprehensive to have credibility. Uh, I totally agree with you, Dan and Pat are on that. I'm just wondering, is the American context somewhat different? Um, a lot of Irish Americans have abandoned the Democratic Party for whatever reason, and a lot of its platform should be lauded. You know, we're all for the poor, we should be. Um, our group is non-political. Um, we let people make up their own political mind in this. But if you talk to 
pro-lifers and ordinary Americans who have switched their vote to the Republican Party, they'd say this is the new Democratic Party that for opportunity zones, judicial reform, um, you know, uh, job creation, tax reform. Uh, look at the number of black Americans who switched their vote to the Republicans. Um, and so it's a difficult it's a difficult um, dynamic to, to, to manage and handle. I'm very optimistic uh, based on, on one thing that uh, Patter said, and that is the, the political landscape in terms of parties in Ireland is different than the United States because the two-party system in the United States is about to come to an end, and it's been a disaster. I don't even use the term Republican or Democrat anymore. It's the party of omission. And the party of commission, the party of commission thinks it's okay to kill babies up to the day of birth. And the party of omission is perfectly okay with the status quo. And they both have their enablers, right? The Catholic bishops enable the Democratic Party. And of course, the uh, mainstream corporate pro-life movement enables the do-nothing party of omission. And regardless of whether Trump gets seated for a second term or not, that's all going to change. Because right, I really believe that we're going to have a party of action that comes out of these ashes, or if Trump does get seated, uh, the Republican Party's done. They're done. All right, They've shown themselves to be absolutely worthless. So I'm very encouraged by what Patters says about the political landscape in Ireland, that it's not a two-party system. That's number one. Number two, in terms of all of us, I've always said that pro-life activism, and I say it's activism, not a movement, hopefully it's not a collective, activism is a mosaic. And all parts of the mosaic have to be polished and in place, all right? Or that mosaic, of course, you see, it's uh, uh, we, we are drawn to that missing piece or that unpolished piece. Uh, so I think that there's a place uh, in what we've talked about, the different aspects of uh, activism that we have present tonight is so, so important. I think that this, e and, and Patter said it, that still 35%, 40% of Catholics still go to mass in Ireland. It is a sleeping giant. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we need to do is wake that giant up. There is a parallel between the Catholic Church in Ireland and what we saw in the United States. But the situation in the United States, I think is, is far worse, all right, because it's far greater. And I think in Ireland, we have a chance with that 35, 40% of mass goers in Ireland to really impact the bishops where the faithful here in the United States have no impact, no influence on the bishops at all. Finally, I think, and one of the things that I have seen uh, here is we got to get past perception, perception. We have to stop worrying about image. We talk about defending life. We talk about the unique, precious, unrepeatable pre-born babies, all right, uh, that uh, uh, are persons from the moment of conception, all right. But you know what? What we need to drive home is this is mass murder. It's mass murder, all right, and the mass wounding of women, and we need to drive that point home, all right. There's, there's only 200 abortionists in the uh, uh, United Kingdom, in, in Ireland, only 200 abortionists. That's what I understand. They're easily identifiable, all right, and so uh, my mind is, just as we're closing abortion mills here in the United States, all right, we need to really focus while Patter is doing his political thing, which is most important, and getting the, the, the Catholic sleeping giant all right, to support all right, this pro-life movement and understand that, get them to understand that the fundamental issue is the life of the unborn and the fact that we're mass murdering them, all right, as it is here in the United States, it is the preeminent issue, it's the defining issue of every single election. You can talk about everything else, but it has to be that way in Ireland with the sleeping giant of the, of the uh, Catholics influencing the bishops. Uh, and then, of course, uh, to build up, as uh, Chris points out, the, the, the frontline 
presence in front of these abortion facilities and pregnancy centers, right? So that uh, we're saving as many babies as we can, helping as many women as we can. To me, that's the humani humanitarian aspect of uh, the movement, right? Is that taking care of these women, most of them uh, in situations, dire situations, and that's why they're considering abortion. So, uh, you know, my emphasis, of course, I I'm an activist, all right? I'm not worried about perception. I am not worried about image. Uh, the other thing I really like about the pro-life movement in, the, in Ireland, it is born out of poverty, right? There really is no money. Uh, these are good-hearted people all over the country that have a heart for the unborn. We're not going to waste a lot of money raising tens of millions of dollars or wasting a lot of time spending tens of millions of dollars to raise tens of millions of dollars. That's one of the things that may have been necessary here in the United States uh, because of the size of the country and the, and the vastness of it. But what that has also caused is a fragmented leadership in the United States. And I really think what we want to do is really have a, a, a very united and focused leadership in Ireland uh, that is the tip of the spear, all right, that can basically, as I said, decisively end the daily mass murder of pre-born children. So those are some of my thoughts. Well, just on a couple of final thoughts too, we could strengthen these international bonds, uh, Pader and everybody here, you know, uh, for special events, March for Life in Washington. If you get the opportunity to come over and send a, send a delegation, uh, we might be able to um, present or organize something special and at least get the Irish message out there on the US stage and vice versa. And then of course we have the um, traditional season of St. Patrick's Day, which goes on all through March. And I know you, obviously it was a non-starter this year with COVID, but hopefully next year, potentially, I know I wouldn't take any bets on it. Um, you know, every year it's amazing. Um, it, it, it gratifies me to see the traditional bowl of shamrocks been presented at the White House. There's no other country on earth gets that opportunity and the media absolutely naturally enough love it. And it speaks to our Irish American roots and friends of Ireland. And you don't have to be Irish uh, to celebrate St. Patrick's Day. Um, and then there's over the years, there was the famous Friends of Ireland in the White House. They'd have their breakfast um, on St. Patrick's morning. Maybe there should be a pro-life Friends of Ireland or something with a pro-life social justice Friends of Ireland. Um, they're just a couple of ideas. Catherine, I just wanted to say to you, because you put in such a, a great, uh, your speech was really inspirational. And I know you have a very busy time with appearances and so on. Is there anything the Irish community can do for you in Ireland or here? Um, if interns are in the United States from Ireland, should they call your office or I'm just wondering? Absolutely. You know, we have <clears throat> met with a number of delegations from Ireland. As people have come over, we take every opportunity to meet. Uh, would love to go over there and work again with the Irish people because there are so many ways that we can stand for life and we can continue to push that message of life uh, from conception to natural death, the full spectrum. But um, but, you know, maybe especially looking at, at some of what we've heard in the last couple of days with these, uh, with these late term abortions and, and some of the horrors that we're hearing coming out of Ireland, you know, people, um, the, the different presenters on this call have been right when they've said that Ireland has gone from one of the safest places in the world to be a baby in the womb to one of the most dangerous and that's something that we need to band together to stop. We at Americans United for Life have been so proud over the decades to work with Irish leaders and, and just the strong Irish citizens in fighting abortion and in standing for life. And we will do everything that we can to continue working with all of you. So absolutely contact the office. We'd love to meet with you. We'd love to come over to Ireland again and, and continue to work with you all there. Um, our doors are open. So it's AUL.com is your website, Americans United for Life. .org. 
Oh, sorry. AUL.org, yes. AUL.org, if they want to reach you. Uh, Chris, if you're looking for interns, you know, giving an opportunity here to um, promote your message, merchandise here a little bit, uh, how do they reach you? Yes, we have a website, prolifeinterns.com. We've taken over 400 Europeans uh, to come and work with us, saving lives on the streets and in our clinics over okay. the last 12 years. We'd love to have more Irish. And yeah. after vaccinations are widespread, that should be possible. Yeah, we pray for that. Uh, Father, uh, you're planning to go back to Ireland? Well, you know, so you, you know what my MO is and you can see why I want my citizenship before I go back to Ireland. I think if I go back before I'm a citizen, uh, I create too much mischief. They're going to put me on a plane, send me back to the United States and say, we don't want to see your face again. So I'm looking forward to it. Um, if if uh, I don't get the citizenship right away, uh, I plan on going back, but we'll we'll do some kind of like low key organizing, and I'd really like to start uh, meeting with some of the bishops there. Uh, I just think it's so so important to get a few of the bishops on board. Again, you're not talking about a USCCB; you're talking about a smaller conference of bishops. Uh, I have a bishop in my lineage. Uh, bishop John Conmey was the Bishop of Kalala. They're going to have a hard time looking at a Father Imbarato and thinking in terms of a Conmey, but the fact of the matter is that I have uh, clergy in my family going back to the 17th century, and so uh, I'm hoping I have credibility. I think that uh, this is a matter of uh, awakening the Catholic Church in Ireland uh, and uh, and then, of course, using that to bring pre-born child killing to a decisive end. Uh, Father, how can they reach you? What, what you? Your website, if you could just give it to us quickly. Well, protestchildkilling.com, protestchildkilling.com. If anybody does a Google search, social media search for protest priest, they'll find me. Hey, Daniel, uh, Danny, how can people... Uh, reach your organization to join the AOH. Can you do a, a sales job here? Yes, sir. We're uh, www.aoh.com is our web page. And if you add a slash join, it'll take you right to our application. Okay. Father, we're going to finish with you and then a closing prayer from Father. And let me just thank you from the bottom of my heart uh, for participating, all the speakers here. It was superb. It was inspirational. I think we made great progress. I think this is the first time we've done it. Um, you know, there's always some learning curves, and I think we've, you know, we've overcome them today. And we'll do this again in the near future. And Father, we look forward to seeing you on the side of the pond. If you wanted to say a few closing words, tell us how we reach your organization. Yep, I suppose if people, thank you for, well, first of all, uh, thank you very, very much for this opportunity. Gurv Milamagat, Milabwekas, the Gach de and and it is, it has been a, a very worthwhile experience uh, for okay. myself. Um, the website we have is aintu.ie, so www.aontu.ie. And if people want to get me, um, my email address is simply padertobin at gmail.com. So P E A D A R. T O I B I N at gmail.com. And you can probably Google it anyways to find it. Yeah. But as I said, I, 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 I'm, I'm a firm believer of practical um, <clears throat> work, setting up organizations, developing that organization, strengthening organizations um, can achieve your, our long term goals. I think, to be honest, I, I probably maybe have a slightly different emphasis from maybe one or two of the other speakers. I do believe that you should speak in the language of the people you were talking to. Um, I always think that, you know, if I go to Germany and start speaking to them in Irish, they're not going to be able to understand me. Um, when I'm campaigning in Ireland, I need to speak in the language of the people uh, who I want to convince. I think that's really important too. Um, but, um, you know, absolutely, if we can build strong uh, Irish-American organisations uh, on this issue, I do believe that we can be mutually beneficial. And again, Mila Buikas, thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to speak. Father, keep up the fantastic work. We're very proud of you. 
Father, do you want to uh, say a closing prayer here tonight? Sure, let us pray. Father in heaven, name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, we ask send the Holy Spirit down upon us. Lord, allow us, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Let us go out uh, into the world and be uh, witnesses for uh, our unborn babies uh, by being witnesses to the world about what is happening to our children, about how each child from the moment of conception is unique, precious, and unrepeatable, made in the image and likeness of God. May we be witnesses of life. May we always stand against this this horrible crime of uh, the mass murder of preborn children. Uh, Lord, please fill our hearts with your love. May we do all things in loving, humble obedience. Allow us always to see your will, always give us the strength to do your will, regardless of the attacks and the trials and tribulations. We ask this through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you. And have a very good, happy, safe, and blessed Christmas. You are. Thank you, Pat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.